Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gluestick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and I have a collection of hundreds, I think it's over 300, monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel much like this one. If you like what I do, please consider backing me on Patreon and subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice a week. So hit that notification bell. Um, I typically upload uh, early in the morning so I can give you something to listen to on your car ride commutes into work in the morning. How have I not talked about the Catoblepis yet? Pliny the Elder, historic naturalist and consummate spinner of hyperbole, described in his circulated book of exotic observations from his travels, and dare I say, a lot of crap he heard over plenty of cheap wine in various seaports, a mid-sized creature, sluggish and with a heavy head and face always turned to the ground. He thought its gaze, like that of the basilisk, was lethal, making the heaviness of its head quite fortunate. This folktale was further backed up by another series of 17 books written by Eelin, which were less a chronicle of the true natural world's creatures and far more like, well, what I'm doing right now. Uh, people back then loved a good fantasy creature as much as we do today. What he was actually describing was the Cape Buffalo, which caked with mud and grazing fit the description perfectly well. So Eelin also, never having seen a real Cape Buffalo, I would wager, described the Catoblepis as a herbivore, about the size of a domestic bull, with a heavy mane, narrow bloodshot eyes, a scaled back and shaggy eyebrows. The head was so heavy that the beast could only look down. In his description, the animal's gaze was not lethal, but its breath was poison, since it ate only poisonous vegetation. The Cape Buffalo is the largest and most formidable of Africa's wild cattle. They are also really hardy and can eat lots of different vegetation. They're not as big as people think though. The Cataplepis is a swamp creature, very similar to the large cattle, and they mainly eat swamp plants and rotting vegetation, as well as opportunistically feeding on carrion, which is highly unusual for any sort of cow. In the Forgotten Realms, the Cataplepis is reasonably well known on the continent of Faerun. If you are anywhere around the bottom of the Anorok Desert, or the former Anorok Desert, if you're a follower of the more recent map, um, now known as the Netheral region, between the Stormhorn Mountains and there across the Goblin Marches and lurking at the foothills in front of the peaks, you can find the Far Sea Marshes, a quite a large area which are infested quite heavily with Cataplepis. People who live around there, most notably the Marsh Drovers, Travelling between the Far Sea and Toon Marshes will tell you this whole area used to be a lake, but it is ever so slowly drying up and may one day disappear. The Marsh Drovers are the cheapest source of the legendary Death Cheese, made from the milk of the Catoblepis. You can buy them uh, from them directly. The merchants who travel across the mountain passes from Cormier and Altergard normally purchase it for around 2 gold pieces per 1 pound or 450 gram loaf of cheese. Otherwise, they would have a hard time beating the shallow keeled trade barges that go all the way up the river mouth connecting to the Dragon Coast, which means you can buy death cheese anywhere that has ports facing the Sea of Fallen Stars, from Sembia all the way to High Amaska. And that is just one rare and famous non-magical product made from one exotic and dangerous creature on a massive continent with trade routes, national states, uh, trade route, um, trade wars, embargoes, pirates, trade consortiums, and so on. One of these days, I have to make some videos about the trade networks and such on this massive and dynamic continent because I don't think uh, it really gets enough press how living and dynamic Faerun is as a world setting. It really is. You can get very deep into it. And it's a perfect setting to set up Matt Colville's Strongholds and Followers and his Kingdoms and Armies Kickstarter is just going at the moment um, as of this video. So you should definitely go and check that out because this is a world where you really can get deeply into it. The natural environment of the Cataplepis inhabit, uh, inhabits is quite difficult to access and navigate and the beasts are not really herd animals nor do they wander around. So ordinary folk will almost never see them. Even swamp folk find very little value in the deep, overgrown and muddy bogs that the Cataplepis prefer anyway. The very presence of these beasts causes a blight that causes the wetland to become increasingly fetid, overgrown, misty and depleted any other, any other sort of beneficial products such as herbs, berries, clean water, fish, crabs and the like. So there's not much point going into these areas unless it is specifically to seek out the Cataplepis. 
The act of milking these creatures is shrouded in mystery. It was once widely believed that only a special group of blind monks could withstand the dreadful gaze of the beasts. This is partially true. The method used by the marsh drovers is to wear heavy mud-coated sacks with tufts of straw that make them look like the dry mounds that naturally occur in these bogs, allowing them to get up right up close to the beasts and use whatever methods they have to charm them or put them into a magical slumber. They don't domesticate the catapleppus, of course, so they can only milk the females who have young calves. The milk is not plentiful, and if you were to drink it, it would most certainly kill you. You'd, you'd die, as it's poisonous. However, it's also rich in a special enzyme. When diluted heavily in normal milk from cow, goat, sheep or horse, it produces this remarkable effect and the resulting curds can be pressed and uh, turned into the soft cheese coated in the characteristic red paraffin wax rind. The act of getting close to the catapleppus is very dangerous. The unpro unprotected eyes of the marsh drovers who do this can be severely damaged just from a glancing strike of the creature's deadly gaze. That they can restore the wounded flesh, but once blinded, they don't have the means to restore their sight. So this is where the legend of the blind monks comes from. Volo's Guide to Monsters in 5th Edition D&D depicts a version of the creature quite similar to the historic myth. It has a head much more like that of a warthog than a buffalo. The body is squat and humped at the shoulders. The neck and tail are greatly extended, much like the ancient thunder beasts that used to live in swamps like this one. Most of the time, the legs of the beast are sunk deep into the muck and mud and filthy water. When approached by anything it doesn't recognise, it will raise the club end of its tail over its head like a scorpion tail in a threatening posture, ready to whip it around and seriously clout anything that gets too close. The stench of these creatures is legendary. It's not only strong enough to burn out your sense of smell, it also coats the tongue and seems to sink into the skin, soaking clothing and seems to taint the very bones of whoever wanders into a cloud of it. Any creature other than a catablebus that starts its turn within 10 feet of the catablebus must succeed on a DC 16 constitution saving throw or be poisoned until the start of the creature's next turn. On a successful saving throw, the creature is immune to the stench of any catablebus for one hour. And the poison effect basically gives you disadvantage on all of your attack rolls and ability checks. So it's fairly disabling. You can also pantomime this as you're retching from basically the bowels up. <laughs> the catablepus actually has a fine sense of smell, paradoxically, and excellent eyesight. They can see in total darkness up to 60 feet and have advantage on wisdom, perception checks that involve their sense of smell, and of course, they're very sensitive to any changes to their familiar territory. Much like cows, they are creatures who prefer routine. Unlike cows, they don't run away from things that disturb them. They rot it to a horrid goop with their necrotic gaze and smash the crap out of it with their clubbing tail. Their passive perception of 12 is not bad, but remember, any movement through the sucking mud and splashing bog water is going to make a lot of noise, unless the player characters are extremely cautious and roll very well on their stealth checks. In combat, the creatures are a challenge rating 5 beast. Uh, they have an armor class of 14, uh, 8d10 plus 40 or between 48 and 120 with an average of 84 hit points. You may want to vary those totals a bit to represent a mated cow and bull with a younger calf present. The pair mate for life and they only ever give birth to single calves, probably once or twice every few years, more frequently in areas hunted by black dragons, who would most certainly include them in their diet. They have a speed of 30 feet, which, although not mentioned in the stat block, would give them an advantage in a combat situation as the difficult terrain they live in um, as they would have no problem moving over difficult swamp terrain but the player characters are probably forced to move at half their normal speed through this difficult terrain. Luckily the catablepus are not known for chasing after people they rarely pursue enemies further than the edge of their territory so in that regard they're kind of like a moose. They are strong and hardy animals with a strength of 19 and constitution of 21. They also are much more agile than you'd think, but it's mainly their accuracy with that clubby tail anyone has to worry about in combat. They're also as stupid as a bag of rocks, with an intelligence of three, so they're very unlikely to change tactics or react with any sort of speed to rapid shifts in the enemy's strategy. For example, they don't really understand arrows or where they come from. They might figure out that two th things that are new are related to each other, such as arrows and new creatures in their swamp, but that's about it. 
Their tail is plus 7 to hit, has a 10 foot reach, hits one target and does 5d6 plus 4 bludgeoning damage. Also, the target must succeed on a DC 16 constituting saving throw or be stunned until the start of the Cataplebus' next turn. The force of the impact from this tail club is sufficient to crumple a metal great helm and seriously dent a metal shield. A solid smash to the top of the head can sink a halfling or dwarf into the mud like a fence post. The infamous death gaze of the Cataplebus targets a creature that it can see within 30 feet of it. The target must make a DC 16 constitution saving throw, taking 8d8 necrotic damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. If, however, the saving throw fails by 5 or more, the target instead takes 64 necrotic damage. Don't even roll for it. Automatic 64. The target dies if reduced to 0 hit points in this way. It is a recharge ability though, once the beast uses the gaze it must roll a 6 sided die at the start of its turn, only regaining use of the power on a result of 5 or 6. Still, that is a tremendously dangerous attack and a very real chance of instant death for lower level characters. Every tactic other creatures use against the Catoblepus is oriented around avoiding this death gaze. An interesting variation on this is to swap the death gaze of the Cataplebus for the breath of a Gorgon. As Gorgons are also challenge rating 5 foe, this really is just as simple as copy-paste. There's also, it's supported by the mythology of the Cataplebus, where the deadly effect was sometimes said to be a toxic mist around the things. So, petrifying breath. Again, recharges on a roll of 5 or 6, the Cataplebus can exhale a petrifying gas in a 30-foot cone. Each creature in that area must succeed on a DC 13 constitution saving throw. On a failed save, the target begins to turn to stone and is restrained. The restrained target must repeat the saving throw at the end of its next turn. On a success, the effect ends on the target. On a failure, the target is petrified until freed by the Greater Restoration spell or other magic. That's less dangerous because it doesn't really, really cause much damage. It's just basically petrifying you. Um, but you might want to add some uh, poisoning damage to that as well if you want to get really nasty. I will certainly throw it will certainly throw a curveball at your players who are expecting something different. But there's no reason why not. The folklore and legends about these creatures is typically a lot of hearsay and imagination. A lot is quite accurate, but some parts are quite wrong, or at least wildly exaggerated. The deadliness of the necro necrotic gaze, though, is quite real. So, as you'd imagine, with the cheese, this product, the legend of these creatures would be exaggerated to help sell the cheese. So, you see what I mean? According to Volo's Guide, the creature has such a feared reputation that stories about it are ingrained into popular culture. Any rumour of a Catoblepus taking up residence nearby is taken to be a bad omen, even if the rumour is proven false. The silhouette of a Catoblepus, with its tail extended over its body and head held low, is a baleful, heraldic figure, signifying death or doom that you see on flags and shields and things. Sages say that gods of pestilence and rot created cataplephases as embodiments of their influence. Whatever the origin of the creature, stories link the cataplephus to misfortune and many of these yarns have elements of truth. Some such tales claim that hags tend, to cata tend the cataplephases like cattle and that a swamp that contains a cataplephus might also be home to a hag that drinks the monster's milk. Although a particular cataplebus might not be linked to a hag, a coven of hags might keep one or more of these beasts as guardians or pets because they're really not that dangerous when you're outside of their territory. Other legends say that those of impure heart can tame a cataplebus. Indeed, some tales have circulated of malevolent warlocks and dark knights who have discovered how to domesticate the beasts and even use them as mounts. The accuracy of these facts, of course, is completely up to you. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Come and join me every weekend for an hour long live stream where I will be eating some death cheese at the start of every episode. Ask me all of your D&D questions and hang out with the community. Do visit my Teespring shop and buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride and as always, thanks for listening, getting deeply nerdy with me and I'll be back with more for you very soon.